you remember, like three, uh, about four or five months ago, President Trump came down with COVID-19. And um, of course, there were different reactions to this. But the point I'm trying to make is that he was rushed into the, to the hospital and they started giving a whole cocktail of drugs. Amongst them was remdesivir, which uh, some of you may have heard of. Heard of. In this segment, you're going to hear a lot about it and a lot, of, a lot about the person who is heading the team that is developing the drug and that is making the drug available to people and institutions and hospitals around the world. And it's just especially my privilege today to uh, introduce to you my friend, Anu, Dr. Anu Oshinusi. Hi, how are you doing? Hello, um, Daniel. Thank you so much for the um, invitation and the opportunity to um, be part of your um, a guest on your show today. I'm really excited to, to be here. Well, we, we've been looking forward to this for quite a while, haven't we? How many months have you been pushing me pushing it off? Let me, just, let me just out you in front of the whole of Nigeria. <laughs> no, not putting it off. Like, well, this is going to be a very special show. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you again for the opportunity. Well, thank you for, me, for, for making it finally. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. Let's see. As I, in Nigeria, as they say in Nigeria. I'm actually um, an AQT girl, both guys. Uh, both my parents are from AQT, from uh, 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 AQT. My dad is from AQT. My mom is from FRLIA. Um, but spent, you know, many, many decades of their lives um, at the University of Ibadan. They went there and they never left. So they're still there. Um, and I grew up in, in that, um, that in the University of Ibadan campus as well and went to school on the campus, primary school, secondary school, and university. So up UI, um, okay. I'm a proud <laughs> alumnus of the University of Ibadan College of Medicine. Um, and then after my medical school um, degree, I moved here to the U.S. Um, for first a little bit of a foray into public and global health. So I went on to get my master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health um, and then spent a few years working on um, global and public health initiatives in the field of HIV primarily. And then after that, I went on to um, do my internal medicine residency at the Rush University Medical um, College in Chicago, Illinois. And after that, went on to do my infectious disease fellowship at the University of Maryland. Um, and then, you know, post, um, post my postgraduate training, my interest has always been in clinical and translational research, trying to develop drugs that are able to um, treat life-threatening diseases um, such as HIV, um, viral hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and now more recently COVID. So I spent a few years in academic medicine doing clinical and translational research in those fields. And then a few years ago, I made the transition to work in um, a clinical research team um, developing drugs um, for um, all these different diseases at a company called Gilead Sciences um, in California. And in my current role, um, a vice president of clinical research, and I oversee our COVID-19 um, program, including the work that we're doing with remdesivir. Remdesivir, that's the drug that we're talking about. That's the drug Trump, President Trump used, oh, excuse me, former President Trump used, right? And that's, it, it, it helps. Yeah. I mean, you, you must have been super excited about the fact that he was using your, your, your baby, right? Yes, no, you know, I think the, the story of remdesivir is really just a testament to, you know, what, what, what the world can do together, like creating possible, um, because it's the work of thousands and thousands of researchers, scientists, um, medical doctors, nurses, research staff, um, regulatory agencies, all coming together towards a common goal of advancing science while also trying to um, create a drug for a new disease that we'd never heard of until, you know, a year, like 14 months ago, 
um, in a very tough environment and with a lot of mobility and maturity and trying to get that through as quickly as possible, but also safe and effectively as possible. So it's a testament to the work of, of thousands and thousands of people, and I've, I'm really glad about the opportunity to be part of that story. No doubts, no doubts. But you are still over overseeing it, and I, I really commend you and applaud your humility and modesty where this is concerned. But we want to know more about this. We want to know more about how that's how that's uh, how that eventually got to be, and uh, hopefully maybe your your plans uh, for for the future. And I know that this is not going to be the last pandemic, unfortunately. I mean, we can only hope that it won't be, but the way things are going, it may be, it may not be. So I'm um, hoping that we can talk more about uh, how you see uh, the trends, infectious diseases, what we can learn or what we need to learn from this present pandemic going forward, and what are the lessons for third world countries like ours. And I have to say this because I think we've been super, super fortunate in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. I, mean, I remember Melinda Gates was saying that she was afraid that we should we start seeing people dying, dead bodies lying in the streets because if the Western world was able to have a later, have a handle on on the, on the disease, I mean, what's going to happen to third world countries like Africa? So we've been fortunate. We don't know all the reasons why. Maybe you can shed some light to it to as we talk about this as to why Africans are, are spared the way we've been spared. Um, but definitely there are lessons to be learned. So I'm hoping we can get in that, into that a little bit. But at this point, I want to take a, we are going to take a short break, break and we'll show a video from a very grateful ex-patient who came down with COVID-19. So, see you guys soon. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Franka Ayuto, I'm 55. I tested positive to COVID-19 on the 27th of November, 2020. Immediately, my doctors administered hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, 1,000 milligram vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D3, all that I took religiously for four days. On the fifth day, I was supposed to return for a follow-up check but on the fifth day, I was very ill. I was ill, I could not, I was feeling that there was no breath in me and I was coughing uncontrollably. And so I was rushed back to hospital. Immediately I was placed on oxygen and uh, the first hospital didn't have um, a knowledge of what to do with me. They were just going to repeat the same drug. So. Um, on a superior advice, I was moved to the COVID center, the main COVID center in Abuja, which is the Guagualada um, Specialist Hospital, because it's attached to a specialist hospital. And when I got there, um, I met a doctor, um, Hamid, I think, who introduced this remisdevil treatment. He told me how expensive it was. In Then it was 350,000 Naira for one ampoule, which is about um, $1,000 by the official exchange rate. And I was to take six. I was to take six, which is about $6,000. I was uh, expected to cough out. Hmm. It was huge. But then, um, anything for my life. So we quickly gathered that, and um, they started with two, two of the remis de uh, like a booster dose. And immediately I felt a lot of relief. The cough, the coughing ceased. Um, I could breathe on well, but though I was still on oxygen, I was sweating. I could talk to my sister. I could sleep. And I felt a lot of relief. And then by the time I took the second, third, fourth, fifth dose, I felt very well. On the sixth day, the oxygen was put aside. I could move around, though I was weak, because they had also to give me the um, steroids, because they said my lungs were already closing down. So I felt good, and the drug really did wonder. We called it the wonder drug here. Um, I am very grateful to the doctors that treated me. I am particularly thankful 
to Dr. Anu Osinibi and her team who uh, researched and discovered this wonder drug. I am very grateful because I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't gotten that uh, intervention, intervention of the Remis de Ville. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Please keep on the good work. All right, welcome back. Now, isn't that a wonderful tes testimonial, Anu? What, what it sure you, is. It, it definitely is. And I think, you know, each time that um, you you hear about, like, stories where people, um, individuals recover from this disease called COVID, it just gladdens your heart, right? Because it's not only, like, for me, like, each person that, that gets COVID and gets sick with COVID, that person has a family, right? That that person is not just an individual, you know, it's affecting not just that individual, but their families, their communities. So just hearing her story, I think was very um, inspirational. And it's it's good to see that she she, she came out with a, a, a positive outcome. And she is super, super, super thankful. But I'm sure you guys stories are like this almost every hour of the day, right? Yeah, you know, it's those stories that keep us all going. I think, you know, one, one thing I can say for my colleagues here at Gilead is that, you know, yes, I mean, everyone is a, it's a very experienced, uh, brilliant, really smart workforce. But I think what really keeps people going that sometimes gets missing is just the passion and the dedication for patients and um, their families and their communities that, you know, like, Patients are our North Star. Like, that's my North Star. That's the North Star for my team because they're tough days. They're challenging days. They're ups and downs. Like, this whole journey of remdesivir has been up and down, and it's been challenging, a pandemic, doing all this with a pandemic. But when you recognize that every, every second that you can go faster and get to that answer quicker means something to someone else. Like, it means something to a patient, it means something to a family, it means something to a community. And that community could very well be yours. Yeah. It could be your family member as well. So we never lose sight of that, and you just keep forging ahead, regardless of the challenges and obstacles. I think when you have pa patience as your center and your North Star, that, that makes you overcome any of the negativity or the challenges um, and just drive things forward. So it's really good, great hearing her story, and it's those type of stories that really just keep us um, moving moving on. Without a doubt. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so Rindesiver was initially a drug developed for Ebola, is that correct? Yes. Um, so I can tell you a few interesting facts about Remdesivir. So Remdesivir itself, is, it's an antiviral drug that mm -hmm. inhibits... Um, a key mechanism in, in a lot of RNA viruses, things, you know, there are different types of viruses, and we call these ones RNA viruses. So it in, inhibits a central um, key activity of that virus as it's trying to, to, to replicate. Um, but the only, the other good part about remdesivir is that it's also broad spectrum. So it actually works against multiple classes of viruses that cause, cause life-threatening diseases, and one of that is Ebola. So when you look back to the story of remdesivir, it's been, you know, drug development is a very long process. You know, it takes on average about 12 years from when you discover a molecule to get it approved. So, you know, the remdesivir work had been going on for a while um, when we discovered that it had activity against Ebola. And I think, you know, at Gilead, we have um, a three-decade history of virology, what, what we've done in HIV, what we've done in hepatitis. And so when the Ebola epidemic in 2014 was happening, we looked through all these compounds that we have in-house to see what can we do to also be helpful in that epidemic at that time happening in the, in the Congo. And one of those things was remdesivir. Um, and so, you know, but, but the way it is with epidemics, by the time you are ready to start trials and go through all, you know, your initial work in in the preclinical space, clinical space, sometimes those epidemics die, 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 and they're gone. So that's really what happened in that first step, um, step with, with Ebola. But what we learned then was 
to partner with regulatory agencies, partner with um, you know partners across the world, the WHO, um, um, you know doctors, um, medicines on frontiers, and so that when the next one happens, we'll be ready um, to see if this is actually a drug that helps. And so you know we we used this in the 2018, 2019, and what what we saw from those studies then was that there were actually some other molecules um, called the monoclonal antibodies, which is a different class of drug that worked better than remdesivir did. Um, so we, you know, those, those drugs have now been approved for Ebola. But then when this epidemic, um, when we got the first case, I think that was the first email that I got was December 31st, I'll not forget it because it was the last day of the year saying that there were these cases of mystery, what's called mystery pneumonia, was a WHO alert in a province called Wuhan in China. And immediately thinking like, okay, if this is a coronavirus, we actually knew that remdesivir from animal studies worked for coronaviruses. If this turns out to be a coronavirus, we actually could be able to help. Never thinking that this was going to be this global pandemic, but recognizing this was happening in in clustered places in China, um, and then it started building up, right? Then the WHO recognized that it's actually a coronavirus, so we started testing, um, and then it just became a global pandemic. But very early on, there were three things that we decided we had to do at Gilead. One was to determine if it worked for, for corona, this new coronavirus, and do it as quickly as possible, and as safely with all the regulatory aspects intact as well to be able to get get it to patients. The second thing was that we needed to manufacture at risk because remdesivir is not an easy one to manufacture. It's an intravenous drug that you have to take many, like the lead time to manufacture it takes 12 months essentially. And we had like 5,000 drugs, 5,000 vials of drug in January of last year. Um, and so you have so, to make this- So what you say at risk? risk. When you say at risk, you are saying that you don't take a chance because it hasn't been approved. It hasn't, all you know yeah. is that it, it works in animals. You didn't, know, you didn't know whether it worked with human beings at that time. Exactly. So that's what I mean. So we're entering the clinical trials, and usually you want to ramp up when all that is done. But if you waited till the studies read out with something that is a 12-month lead time, it's 27 different unique sequences chemical processes to manufacture it, and some of them are sequential, so you have to do one to get to the next one. Um, and if you totally wait till then, we wouldn't have remdesivir. Like, we'll just be, like, having very limited doses at, at this point in time. So, you know, that's the thing about, like, the, the companies, the company decided, our leadership, like, we're going to, we're going to do this investment. If it doesn't work, then yes, I mean, that's an investment that you're not going to take back, but, but that's fine because it's the right thing to do. What now, if it does work? Let me quickly ask, yeah. what about 5,000 files? Is that if it's something you can't uh, uh, reveal, then that's fine. But what, 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 when you say risk, financially, what would that, what, what would that risk you are taking, financial risk, in making those 5,000? Yeah, so you know, at that time, we had the 5,000 files left over from our prior studies. Okay, um, got and that, that, yeah, so that 5,000 vials would only be helpful for, um, you know, a few people, pe people that are going to be on clinical trials. And then we had really a lot of challenges about supply because we had very limited supply. So we had to ramp up that manufacturing. And of course, where we are now a year later is we're able to meet the, the, the global supply. But that's because of all those investments that we had to make right then and there. So before, that's more before you knew whether or not it would work or it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Or be, be yeah. Got it, got it. Yes, yeah. yes. And we also decided like we had to do responsible access, right? So, you know, at that point in time, there was much more of a demand than we had enough drug. Um, people were getting very sick. Um, and so we started typic, uh, something called a compassionate use program where people were given the drug um, you know, give, giving the drug away, but even as we are manufacturing, making sure that we could distribute it as, as ethically as possible as we can. But in parallel, working as we are ramping up those manufacturing panels, working in parallel with our, um, you know, generic manufacturers, 
to be able to supply like you know um, remdesivir for across across the globe. So working domestically and internationally to ensure that we had a much more robust supply chain um, mm-hmm. that would be able to meet the demand. So those are things that we put in place very early, and then we partnered with multiple different. Um, 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 teams across the globe of scientists to try and get the answers. Did it work? Was it safe for COVID? Um, and I'm glad we were able to to get that done very quickly. And so it became the first approved um, agent for for COVID in in the U.S. Um, and it's also still the first antiviral um, approved for COVID. And so now it's been approved in over 50 countries um, right. across the globe. Wow, wow, that's impressive. And this is all, you are always throughout the process. You are, you are the, the leads, let's put it that way, for this process. Yes, yes. So uh, the, the lead for our remdesivir program, but uh, again, as I say, you know, it's, it's a team of amazing individuals um, that are totally passionate and dedicated and committed to, to getting it done. And it's not just the people doing the clinical trials and the operations. It's the folks in the manufacturing working all shifts. Like it was 24 hour shifts of teams across the globe, 24 seven that didn't, as one team is handing off at the end, the next one is coming in to make sure that we're able to ramp up manufacturing. It's the regulatory team. It's the, it's a, it was a company effort. Everyone came together across the company to ensure that we were able to get this done as quickly as possible for the greater good, um, and to be able to get this 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 to patients across across the globe. Well, a big a big shout out to to your team over there and uh, Gilead over, overall. I'm sure um, lots of people all over the world who are grateful that they you did what you did. Uh, so we're going to take a, a short break now, and we'll be back for a few minutes. So folks, do not go away. Welcome back. All right, so I know he's talking to Dr. Shinusi. Never going to get used to that. Dr. Shinusi is getting is, is talking to us about the whole story about Remdesivir and how uh, her team over at Gilead are doing a fantastic job pushing it all out. Uh, I know how, how how much of this like is this? A, I mean, if you can't reveal it, is, is that and is that like a monthly uh, quota that you say that you that you produce and send out each each month? Is there something like that? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Diane. So what I would say is that, you know, currently um, with all the work that we were able to do and ramp up um, manufacturing, we're all, we've been able to, to meet the, the d- demand for remdesivir. Um, at least we're able to, to get there um, before the end of the year. But in parallel, I think what is more relevant to, um, you know, to Nigeria, for instance, is is that what we did um, with remdesivir, similar to what Gilead actually has done over the years with HIV and um, hepatitis C products that we have, is partnering with um, generic manufacturers to be able to also meet that global demand. And the way we do it is really just a tech transfer um, and making sure that you select generic companies um, primarily, they're in India. So we're, we're we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Is that what you're saying, in terms of getting the the generic drugs? Did I miss that? Well, so you know, Nigeria is on. It it, it becomes um, so. It's one thing to make something available through generic manufacturers. On the other end, it has to be within Nigeria, and you know, the regulatory agencies within Nigeria. Um, and the folks deciding the health policy in Nigeria to see if remdesivir is one of the drugs that they do want on the arsenal for for COVID-19. So there are drugs that are available, but not every country necessarily wants that drug in their country or registers that drug in country because you know it still has to go to NASDAQ has to review the the dossier and all the regulatory authorities decide on which drugs are brought into Nigeria. But what I will say is that from the Gilead end, um, those nine companies that we have partnered with, um, primarily in India, um, Nigeria is one of those countries that can 
um, access remdesivir at a very low affordable rate through the generic manufacturers. And you see some com some countries have done that and have, you know, brought in a lot of remdesivir to their countries in that 127 list. And some other countries have not. And unfortunately, I can't really speak to the situation um, that is on ground in, in Nigeria. I think someone else will probably be better able to speak to that. Um, but the whole goal is to make it affordable. Of course, what then happens around retail and markup within the country and the drug flow um, sometimes can be concerning as mm -hmm. to how yeah. these things then get right to the final consumer because it's supposed to be produced and manufactured at a very, um, you know, at, at a made available at a very affordable rate. Right, right. Well, Doc, we're going to have to take, we're going to have to end this one, this particular show, this at this point. Uh, first of all, thank you, Andrew, for for making this making the time, and I know it's, it's, even your weekends are super busy. So, uh, thank you again. So, God bless. Take care. Bye.